We're looking at the third church in Asia Minor, or what well, was Asia at that time, uh, that uh, is being, writ, uh, being sent messages from the Lord uh, through the uh, Apostle John in the book of Revelation. And we're in chapter 3 today, and starting with verse 12. Uh, it's this particular uh, letter to the church at Pergamon is following the same outline as the others do. It starts with a description of Christ, and to the angel of the church at Pergamon write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. Again, this sharp two-edged sword harpens back to chapter 1 and in verse 16. But uh, what does it mean that he has a sharp two-edged sword coming uh, from his mouth? Uh, probably one of two things. Maybe, maybe they overlap and join together. It speaks of God's words, the, the speaking of the Lord, the word of God spoken by the Savior. It also can speak of his word spoken in judgment. So his word and also the issue of judgment is in line with uh, the idea of the sharp two-edged sword. And he says, I know, as he, as he says to every one of the churches, I know where you dwell, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. So we have a, a city that is just inundated with the corruption of the devil himself. Uh, and you hold fast my name right there in the midst of all that corruption, that uh, spiritual uh, impurity and power, they are standing fast. So he's commending them for that. And he said, and, and did not deny my faith even in, in the days of Antipas. Antipas was someone who apparently uh, was martyred for the cause. My witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And so they had at least one individual there that had been martyred, but they stood fast. Uh, they held their faith. And so the Lord commends them for standing in the midst of, of that kind of persecution. But now he moves on to his condemnations, and he says, but I have a few things against you because you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So first of all, he has this against them. They are, they are following the teachings of of Balaam. Now, Balaam was that prophet back in the Old Testament who, uh, I remember his donkey talked to him, that's, uh, that's his claim to fame, but uh, he tried to curse Israel and failed. God would not let him curse Israel. So he taught Balak how to be a stumbling block to Israel by introducing immorality and idolatry to the people of Israel, and it caused the people of Israel to stumble. So we have a, 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 this prophet who, is, uh, who leads uh, them into compromise with sin. And so they're listening to somebody like that who is causing them to compromise with, uh, with the truth of God and compromise with sin. He also has against them in verse 15 something else. He says, so you also have some who in the same way hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. We saw them before, probably a group that was uh, taking the grace of God and using it as a license to sin. So he's, he's concerned about that as well. So what is the correction? Uh, verse 16, therefore repent. Just as he had said earlier to the church at Ephesus, uh, they needed to repent. They needed to recognize they were doing wrong. They needed to switch directions, first of all, in their minds, change directions in their thinking, uh, and recognize that they're going in a direction of sin and, and desire to turn the opposite direction. And that should, should result in a changed life as well. And so therefore repent or else, now he's going to, to, uh, to warn them, else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. So if you're not going to do the right thing, I'm going to come and I'm going to make war against those who are causing problems here. So this could, could be all the false teachers as well as those who are bought in through these false teachings. Verse 17, he moves on to the challenge. If you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. Uh, the manna, of course, was the food that the Lord uh, used to give Israel, get them through the wilderness. And he speaks here of a hidden manna, some kind of sustenance that they would need uh, to, to live. And so this is a promise of, of, sust of sustenance, of something of real value in, uh, in, a, in a spiritual sense, and I'll give them a white stone. A white stone, we, we're not exactly sure about this, but one thing we do know is that in the first century, for people going to the games, uh, the uh, Olympic-type games, 
a white stone would often be given to them as uh, people to as promotions that would allow them to enter the games. So it would be sort of like their ticket. It would be a free promotional to get them into the games. And so probably it's something like that. I'll give them a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So this is a very special, personalized gift to the people of God. Uh, their name is on that stone, and only the one who gives it to them and only the one who receives it knows what that name is. So it's a very personal thing. And he's promising them, uh, in other words, that they will overcome, they will be given great gifts uh, to, uh, in the presence of the Lord as a result of their living as he wants them to live. So this is the message to the church at Pergama. Uh, it's, a, it's a church that has some good things going, but it's struggling with a number of issues. The Lord warns them and he corrects them and he challenges them as he does you and I. We'll look at one more church this week tomorrow.